I'd like to begin my speech by describing a profession. Now, let's first talk about the salary of this profession. You know, the average salary is around $250,000 to $300,000 every year. It's the same profession where you can have a positive impact on the lives of thousands of people in your community. It's also the same profession where you can be a lifelong learner and push the boundaries of medicine. However, it is also the same field where one in five are considering leaving in the next two years. It's the same profession where we lose one person a day from suicide. And it's the same profession that boasts the highest divorce rates out of any profession out there. Now, of course, I'm talking about the physician. Now, why is there such a discontent right now with physicians? Why are physicians leaving in mass exodus as they're going through this? Well, to first start off, of course, you might know that we have gone through a pandemic, and that has caused huge stress and burnout amongst physicians. But there is a lesser known one, and that is the advent of digital solutions into the healthcare space. Now, you might be thinking, well, digital solutions are great, you know, using Zoom to contact your doctor, or, you know, using Apple Watches to monitor your fitness and health. We can use those to, you know, help push patients and help better their outcomes. But put yourselves in the shoes of a physician, someone that has worked 30 plus years in their profession, helping their communities and honing their practice and making it perfect. Now, now consider that insurance companies come in and they require you to adapt these solutions. They're pushing you to now take on these solutions in order to better patient outcomes, when in reality there's no data that's shown that. And so now we're running into an issue where physicians are leaving, and out of the million physicians that are currently practicing in the United States, 200,000 are considering leaving in the next two years. So why don't we just fix it by bringing in more doctors? Well, unfortunately, despite the fact that 60,000 of people apply every year to medical school, only 30% get in. This is about 20,000 people, so clearly that's not enough to match the deficit that we're gonna be facing in the next few years. So the pipeline is broken. On one end, we see physicians leaving in mass exodus, and on the other, we can't fill, we can't fill the gap fast enough with new medical students incoming. So what can be done about it? How do we help physicians onboard into digital solutions? How do we bring new medical students into the fold. So I'm going to first begin talking about why I personally you know, fell in love with this area of medical education and specifically the digital solutions in healthcare by describing a bit about my background. So I grew up in a place called Blueford, Illinois. It's a small rural farming community that had a huge population of about 600 people. Um, and you know, this town, or actually village, because of how small it was, had one education center. It was called Farrington Grade School. And this grade school taught 39 children. So let me just reemphasize that. 39 children for the whole school. So kindergarten through eighth grade. Everyone was taught. So kind of like a little house on the prairie situation of a boarding school, um, you know, we've seen or the educational inequities that impacted my life and my early upbringing resulted in me ultimately being pulled out of school to help, one, help take care of the family farm, but two, to also help teach my brother and sister as they went through grade school. Now, it was here and during my time going through homeschool and that education system that I found and discovered the power of education and learning, and I found that education would be the way to transcend these intergenerational poverty boundaries and to increase you know, the socioeconomic status despite an, a, a rough upbringing. After going through high school and moving on to college, I wanted to work on a field of psychology called pedagogical tools. Now, this is just a fancy way of saying to learn something, to create something. I didn't want to be the teacher, but I wanted to be the person that created the tools that teachers used to help their students succeed. And it was here at Florida Southern 
that I discovered that the best way for people to learn was through the use of digital solutions, you know, mobile apps, computers, video games. All of those are fantastic examples of ways that people could use these technologies to learn and improve their situation despite their, you know, despite their upbringing. But, of course, a lot of what my research did was improve the education system and the lives of people who were younger than myself or at my same age. You know, I was a 20-year-old infused in the digital world, and so I didn't really consider how do I teach people who don't have the technical literacy of someone at the age of 20, that don't have the, or the, the gap that exists right now in this technical literacy. So, after that, in 2020, I applied to medical school for the first time. And along with 40,000 other people, I received the dreaded rejection letter from every medical school I applied to. So, what makes getting into medical school so difficult? Well, of course, you have to show your commitment to volunteering and shadowing. You have to put thousands of hours into your coursework. You have to show a commitment to the social services. But you can't standardize the humanities. You can't standardize your volunteering. So other metrics had to be developed in order to show your ability to you know, pursue medicine. And two of those metrics come down to the GPA and the MCAT. Now, the GPA, of course, the grade um, point average, is a common metric most people are familiar with. But the MCAT is the Medical College Admissions Test, which is just the ACT-SAT equivalent except for the fact that this test expands 12 semesters of content, everything that you would expect a medical student to need to know, like biology, so sociology, and anatomy and physiology, but it also includes things like physics and general chemistry. So why have this difficult metric? What's the purpose of this test that's incredibly difficult? And what else makes it difficult? Well. The average cost to study for this exam is reported around $2,500. Just to study for this exam, you have to put roughly 400 hours into it. That's about 10 weeks of full-time commitment, or two months. So by a show of hands, how many of you have the next 10 weeks off and $3,000 in your bank account? So not only does this hinder people on the lower end of the socioeconomic spectrum? But then on top of that, you have to spend nearly $5,000 to apply to medical schools. You apply to 30 medical schools, and on average, people get two interview invites. And that's it. So if you don't land those two interviews, you're not going to medical school. Now you have to cope with this uncertain future of not being able to know what you're going to do next year. You have to cope with the fact that you know, you maybe have to scramble for a master's program or study for the MCAT again. And just as another fact, roughly two-thirds of the people that apply to medical school have to apply twice, and those people also take the MCAT three times. So not only are you putting in 400 hours once, not only are you putting in $2,000 hour, $2, once, you're putting it in two, three, four times. So. I've probably convinced you that getting into medical school is difficult. So why even have this metric, this MCAT? What's, what else does it do aside from that? And you might be you know, shaking your hand at this guy, like why even have it if it just blocks people out from the lower end of the socioeconomic spectrum? Well, it's actually a really beautiful thing. This test is a really great thing, and I know I kind of sound crazy defending a standardized test, but it's a really great thing for people that are on the lower end. And the reason why is, I'll just begin with an example. How many of you have heard of Florida Southern College by a show of hands? Yeah, not too many people. Now, how many of you have heard of Harvard University by a show of hands? Wow, every hand went up. So. How many of you have also heard that Harvard is considered academically rigorous? But do you know if Florida Southern College is academically rigorous? You had never heard of Florida Southern five, before five seconds ago when I told you. So you have no idea. Now put yourself in the shoes of an admissions committee member. You are someone who is trying to look for the brightest mind to bring into your medical school. 
you're trying to look for someone that's going to, you know, really bring their commitment to the school. And you have someone from Florida Southern College with a 3.9 GPA and someone from Harvard with a 3.7. Who do you choose? How do you know that this, you know, assuming everything's standardized, the majors are the same, how do you know that the classes at Florida Southern are the same caliber as those at Harvard? And you can't know that. So that's the purpose of this test. That's the big point, is it's a great way, it's the only standardized academic metric, and it's the only standardized metric in general that an admissions committee member can use to evaluate your candidacy to get into medical school. Because it doesn't matter if that person at Harvard has a higher GPA than me, it doesn't matter if they had a harder major, if I scored, let's just say, in the 90th percentile on the MCAT and they scored in the 80th percentile, I did better than them. And vice versa, if they scored in the 90th and I scored in the 80th, they did better than me. It doesn't matter your academic upbringing and it doesn't matter your ability, you know, out in, within the classroom at your respective school. So now, there's the punchline. We have a standardized way to approach, we have a standardized academic metric, but we don't have a standardized way to prep for it. Again, students plug thousands of hours, put hundreds of thousands of dollars into this programs to get question banks, to get courses, and they see no results. And these, you know, they put in these hours and this time just to get the average, and then they have to reapply again. So that's where I really discovered that I had a unique vantage point from my financial and educational inequities growing up on a, in rural Illinois to my, my, uh, my educational background at Florida Southern. I was able to work with two alumni from there to create a mobile app called King of the Curve. Now this app is working to improve the accessibility to these different tests and specifically focused on the MCAT. Because if you're able to give students the ability to approach the test and have a standardized way to prep for it, then you can truly see the best individuals come forth, have the best caliber. It's not just based on how much money can you put into a course or a test prep or how many times you can take it. Because if you're a non-traditional student that is coming back and trying to study, you might not have the financial capabilities. You might not have the time to put into this exam. And so, along with that, we have discovered that, you know, and despite, you know, the initial success of achieving 30,000 downloads in a little over a year, there's still a lot of work to be done. I imagine not all of you are pursuing the medical profession, and, but despite that, there are plenty of other professions out there that require these standardized tests. Grad students need the GRE. Law, law students need the LSAT. So, there's still a lot of work to be done to improve accessibility. Now you might be thinking, well, didn't you just start out the talk by saying digital solutions are harming healthcare? And it's true. And it's because that these digital solutions are built from the perspective of the people that are in computer science, that are in tech, that don't have a concept of what it means to be a frontline healthcare worker. And we all have this concept of digital solutions, and specifically those in ed tech, you know, you know, iPads invading the classrooms, and the whirring and the chirping of all of the different things happening in the notifications. And we also have, you know, AR and VR being uh, implemented in patient and clinical trials. So it's very important that, you know, as you move forward, you see the importance that digital solutions can have and the power that they can have on individuals' lives and their trajectories. But it's equally important that you build these solutions and that you focus on these solutions from a lens of who you're building it for. And within the healthcare world, you know, my job right now is currently to network with physicians, to network with medical students from not only the United States, but from around the world. And these frontline healthcare workers that go in every day to battle COVID, to battle other diseases and afflictions that afflict their practice in their countries, they're not you know, looking up and shaking their hand at the sky saying, where's the next digital solution? They're not saying that. They wanna do what's best for their patients at the time. They wanna do what's going to have the best outcome for them, the best outcome for their patients. 
And so what I want to leave you with here today is that if you are a business owner, if you are a leader in your industry, or you're trying to come up with the next big thing, that you build it from the perspective of the user, that you focus it on that user-centric design. Because it's only through that lens that we're able to you know, fully adapt and not drive people away from the profession that you're trying to save. Thank you for your time. Thank you.